All right, good afternoon, everyone. It's another sunny afternoon, and time for another amazing Authors in Google talk. Um, today, we're pleased to host Dr. David Friedman, who is a noted economic and legal theorist and professor of law at Santa Clara University. He's author of one of the most influential texts on anarcho-capitalism, The Machinery of Freedom, A Guide to Radical Capitalism, which outlines, among other things, Friedman's law, stating that all government functions are carried out at twice the cost that they um, initially should entail. Um, it, he also wrote Hidden Order, The Economics of Everyday Life, which is another very awesome read. But most importantly, today he's going to be speaking to us on his latest book, which is entitled Future Imperfect, Technology and Freedom in an Uncertain World. Um, Future Imperfect describes the, and discusses a variety of technological revolutions across the next 30 years that may or may not happen, and the um, impacts that each one of these decisions will have on the human experience and on you know, life, life in general. As they say, at times they are changing, and so David will be giving us a guide to some of those changes. Through, uh, through these thought experiments, you'll be able to you know, see, see the impact of future technologies, and we'll also have time for question and answer at the end if you want to uh, discuss any of these further with, with David. Um, one final bit of trivia about David is, is his, um, one of his great hobbies, which is medievalism. He, him and his wife actually publish medieval cookbooks, which I think is really awesome. And David has a long-standing relationship with the Society for Creative Anachronism, SCA, and he, um, he actually founded the, the largest gathering of SCA um, reenactors in, in the world, which takes place annually in, in Pennsylvania. Um, the, the one quote from Wikipedia that I especially like that is, is uh, relevant to, to the Pennsylvania War is that he declared war on himself and lost. But today we have a very winning book and we'll be able to talk about the future and, and how technology will impact our lives. Um, we do have the Q&A mic, as I mentioned. Please use that for the benefit of our, of our YouTube and virtual audiences. And you can always find out David's blog as well on the internet. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming David Friedman. worth the paper it isn't written on. And that particular snippet of oral history doesn't happen to be true. <laughs> it is a dramatized and simplified version of a rather more complicated set of events. But putting that aside, uh, there's a grain of truth in it. Uh, at some point in the process from my writing the book to Cambridge publishing it, they lost the dedication. And that's why I have this up on the screen, so that I can restore the missing dedication to a few of the friends whose ideas I have stolen. Uh, it's all right. At least two of them have also stolen my ideas. So. Uh, this book grew out of a seminar I used to teach at Santa Clara University Law School uh, that I called Legal Institutions of the 21st Century. It was still the 20th century when I started teaching it. And it was really a fun seminar. Every Thursday, we would discuss some technology that I was willing to argue for at least a week was going to revolutionize the world. <laughs> On the weekend, the students would email me the legal issues that that revolution would raise. I put them up on the class webpage for the other students to look at. Tuesday, we would discuss those issues and how they might be dealt with. Thursday was another revolution. So I thought of it as sort of the intellectual equivalent of one of those tours of Europe you hear about, where every day is another capital. Gray, nanotech has just turned the world to gray goo. It must be March. Uh, we covered a very wide range of technologies. Uh, they included encryption and surveillance, which is in some sense what got me into this set of issues originally, uh, but also eCash technological protection of intellectual property, biotech, nanotech, virtual reality, uh, mind drugs, half a dozen other things I'm forgetting, uh, and I ended up with a chapter on space. So I was delighted to see the nice model airplane you have hanging up uh, a little ways off in this building, which is, I gather, a prototype of Spaceship One, full size. Uh, and I'm really talking about two different issues. One of them is about technologies and what they might do, and the other is what are their effects and how might people adapt to them? How might we adjust? How might we deal with them? I don't discuss the question of stopping technologies. For at least purposes of the book, I want to argue that there are no breaks available. And that's a slight exaggeration, but not much of an exaggeration. That some people, for example, think that ending aging would be a bad thing. I don't agree, but some people think that. But even if they think that, if medical progress is going to make it possible to stop growing old, 
There are a whole lot of old people in the world who don't want to die. Many of them have money. Many of them have political power. There is no dictator ruling the whole world. So if it can be done, it probably will be done. And so the interesting question for me is not what should you stop, but how do you adapt? And it's adapting to a very wide range of futures. Some of them are catastrophic. Some of them are wonderful. And we just don't know what we're going to have, have happen. Uh, to begin with, the obvious effect of technologies is to change what you can do at what cost. And that can be a good thing. It lets you do things you want to do. Uh, I wrote my second book using a word processor. And when I finished, one of my conclusions was that prior to the invention of the word processor, no books were written. It's just too much work. <laughs> uh, on the other hand, uh, there can be a downside to being easier to do things. That we usually think of the limitation on wiretaps as the need to get a judge to approve them. But that isn't really true. The real limit historically on wiretaps was they were very expensive. Because a wiretap requires policemen spending many, many hours of time to get a few snippets of information. That problem has now been solved. All right? We have speech to text software. We have software that can look through text looking for words, phrases, other signs. Uh, I don't know if any of you ever saw an old comedy called The President's Analyst. But it has this wonderful scene where the protagonist, who various groups are trying to grab to use him to influence the president, uh, turns out that the bad guys behind all the other bad guys are the telephone company, which at this point has no human beings in it at all, fully automated. And the, so our hero uh, is in a, on a lonely rural road. He goes into a telephone booth, calls up a CIA agent who's been helping him, and tries to open the door of the telephone booth, and it doesn't open. And down the road comes a truck with some telephone booths in the back and a crane, picks up the booth with the protagonist in it, puts him in the truck, picks up an empty telephone booth, puts it down, drives off. 30 seconds later, a helicopter descends with the CIA agent and a KGB agent, who is his temporary ally. And the CIA agent looks at the empty phone booth and he says, it can't be. Every phone in America tapped? And the KGB agent looks at him and says, don't be absurd. Where do you think you are, Russia? It can be done. All right. Uh, I did some rough estimates. I figure a couple of billion dollars of dedicated hardware, and you can tap every phone in America. Uh, so that's one of the downsides. Uh, what's the response when technology changes? In particular, what's the response when it becomes harder to do something because of what other people can do? And the obvious response is, However hard it is, keep doing what we're doing. That's what the law says. That's the law. Enforce it. All right? That's the wrong response. The right response is to say whatever we're doing has purposes, that we do things for a reason. And the relevant question is not how do you keep doing what you're doing, but how do you achieve your objectives under the new circumstances? So that, for example, probably in the case of wiretaps, the real solution is not to try to stop the wiretaps, but to try to encourage the use of encryption because it does no good to tap a phone if you don't understand what's happening on that conversation. That would be one very simple example. We'll come into others. Uh, let me start with a fairly big one that's been bothering people quite a lot for the last 10 or 20 years, and that's the death of copyright. All right? The purpose of copyright law, the argument for copyright law, is to give people an incentive to write books, make movies, sing songs, and so forth. And in order for that to work, you have to have a system where you can control copying well enough so that people aren't able to make copies of stuff they want uh, without paying a licensing fee. And in the past, that was mostly true. You could photocopy a book, but it cost as much as buying it and gave you something less useful. And it's pretty obvious that it's becoming less and less true now, that digital information is very easily and cheaply copied. And it's easily distributed, because we've got the internet, so that you're not limited to stealing the songs that a friend of yours has. You can get copies from somebody on the other side of the Atlantic who's willing to let you download it. And the response mostly, which I believe will ultimately be unsuccessful, is to try to get more and more ferocious ways of enforcing the law, basically. It isn't undoable, all right? If you really say, well, we've, this is law, we have to enforce it, it's pretty straightforward. You just make a legal requirement that every computer's hard drive be accessible on the web 
two uh, spiders provided by the copyright owners, which crawl over your hard drive's contents looking for stuff that belongs to them that you don't have a license for. But I don't think that that's going to fly. I hope it won't fly, but I'm pretty sure it won't fly. That that's a case where your cost of enforcing the law becomes larger in terms of privacy and related issues uh, than the law is worth. So what can you do? Well, one very interesting solution, uh, which doesn't work for most things but works for some things, is technological protection. All right, what uh, IBM used to call a cryptolope, what Intertrust called a uh, digibox before they went bankrupt. Uh, but the basic idea is you put your intellectual property in some kind of an encrypted container, people have to pay to use it. And the fundamental weakness in that is what's referred to as the analog hole. That I pay to play a song once, I have a tape recorder sitting there, I record the song, it's now out of your digibox. And you can think, obviously, of smoother ways of doing that, but the basic logic is there. And the implication of that is that technological protection cannot work for any form of intellectual property that's fully revealed on one use, like a song or a novel. But not all forms of intellectual property are. If any of you happen to be lawyers, you will be familiar with Westlaw and Lexis, which are enormous databases of legal information that essentially every lawyer in the country pays the companies that provide them for access to them. And it's true if I do a Lexis search, I can give my friend a copy of the printout but he's not interested in the same case I am, so it's of no use to him. So that means that a database can be protected technologically if you do a good enough job of keeping people off your server, in a sense in which a novel can't be. And when I started thinking about this, I started thinking about movies. And I had various odd and implausible ideas for how you could make a movie that wasn't fully revealed in one use, maybe by letting the user tell what view he saw it from and things like that. And at some point, I suddenly realized that I and all members of my family were spending many hours a week consuming a form of intellectual property, which was indeed the solution to the problem of how do you technologically protect a movie. It's called World of Warcraft. <laughs> I can film my adventure on World of Warcraft, and Blizzard doesn't care, because what other people want is not a film of my adventure, but to have their adventure. So that one of the interesting things that occurred to me is that uh, online games like World of Warcraft are protectable in the modern world in a sense in which movies no longer are protectable. Yeah? And that has some interesting implications for what entertainment is going to look like over the next few decades, if I read it correctly. Uh, now, of course, there are other ways you can make money off your intellectual property. For example, uh, I don't just have the dedication on my web page. The whole book's there. It's true it's a late draft. I haven't updated it yet, but I will. And it's going to stay there because I own the online rights to this book. That was part of the deal with the publisher. Well, why do I do that? Well, one reason is I get invited to talk to a bunch of interesting people like you people by having people know that I'm someone out there with interesting ideas. Uh, also, I write books largely to spread ideas. It's not my main way of making an income. Uh, and there are lots of other ways in which people can give away intellectual property and make money off the tie-ins that uh, Bill Buckley, somewhere in the introduction to a book of his old lectures, comments that the secret that authors won't tell you is that giving lectures pays better than writing books. And people like Mark Twain, as you may know, made a good deal of their income by making a reputation by writing books and then going on the lecture circuit getting paid for doing it. And you can think of other things. You write a book on some subject, you're then hired as a consultant. Uh, so there are a variety of different ways. You, you give away uh, MP3s of your songs and you charge for concerts. Uh, but the basic point I'm really making is that faced with the death of copyright, the long run solution is not to try to keep it alive. The long run solution is to say in a world where as a practical matter you can't prevent copying, how do you make money producing intellectual property? And that that's the right approach for all of these issues. Let me take another case and one that I find particularly intriguing. And that's the case of defamation, of libel and slander. That under our current legal regime, if you publish in a newspaper a story saying that I'm a convicted murderer, and I'm not, I can sue you and collect money. And that's a mechanism for keeping people from publishing lies. That mechanism is working less and less well. Because for that mechanism to work, you have to have a world where any time that somebody publishes a lie to a large enough audience to matter, the 
Target A knows who did it, and B, the person who did it, has enough resources to be worth suing. But anybody nowadays can get a web page. Uh, if you're clever, you can probably get a web page without identifying yourself. You can put stuff up on that web page which is defamatory. If nobody knows who you are, maybe they shut down the web page, but the lie is out there. Uh, and even if they know who you are, there's no reason to think you have enough assets to be worth suing. Similarly for Usenet News, similarly for spamming email, we've got a whole bunch of very good technologies for spreading information, including false information. What's the solution? The solution is to remember that there has always been a different approach to, to dealing with lies about yourself, and that was to answer them. All right? So that somebody tells a lie about me, I say it's not true. The same technological changes that make it so much cheaper and easier to spread lies about me also make it easier not only to spread the truth, but to spot the lies. All right? You people are responsible, of course. That uh, I do a good deal of uh, posting on Usenet News, which I assume some people in this room still know about, even though it's become a less important part of the internet in the last decade or two. Uh, using Google, and before that a previous service that you bought out, I can each day check to see if anybody on 100,000 news groups has mentioned my name. If they've mentioned my name, I can see what they said. If I don't like what they said, I can post a response on the same thread in the same news group contradicting what they said. It says, if I was sitting on a hill and the winds of the world blew to my ears any mention of me and then blew back my answer to everybody who heard the mention. So the same technology that makes the use of the courts to prevent defamation harder makes the use of answering easier. Uh, now, it doesn't work on the web, unfortunately. I can spot it with Google, but I can't answer it. Because when you put up a web page and I put up a response, unless people are looking for it, they won't see the response. There's a technological solution. And the technological solution is for browsers to show backlinks. To have a browser which not only shows who, who this page links to, but who links to this page. There is a potential legal problem with this technological solution. And that is that one could argue that when your browser, say your browser, since you now have a browser, shows my web page plus the links from other people's web page to it, which is what we need so that people will know that you've answered my comment, I then sue Google on the grounds that they are engaged in contributory infringement of my copyright because they are making a derivative work. They are making a copy of my web page with added material that I didn't want there. And that, it can at least be argued, as a derivative work. And this is an issue that's been litigated not in this context, but in the framing context, where somebody puts up someone else's web page with their ads around it. And the interesting point here is that if you want to stop defamation, I'm arguing, you've got to make sure that copyright law doesn't get interpreted in a way that would block browsers with backlinks. So it's sort of interesting as non-obvious relations among different things in this, in this world and this, this set of problems. Uh, let's go on. I spoke so far about the fact that technological change changes what you can do. It also changes the world in a somewhat more subtle way. All of us think and legal systems deal with the world through approximations. When it says on the news that it's 97 degrees in the shade, they don't tell you which patch of shade they're thinking of. And they aren't all identical. But we can get away with those approximations because most of the time they're close enough to true so that, that they work. As you change the technologies, some of the approximations break. So that, for example, we are used to thinking that everybody at some point had a mother and father and that we know what those terms mean. As it happens, there is a real legal case in the state of California now settled which centered on a baby with five parents. All right? There was a couple who wanted a baby. The husband was sterile 
and the mother was doubly infertile. She could neither produce a live egg nor bring a fetus to term. That's all right. That's what markets are for. They found a sperm donor, an egg donor, and a host mother and produced a baby. No problem, except that at about the point the baby was born, the couple broke up. Who are the parents? Who has legal rights and obligations with regard to that baby? If the court had chosen to read the law of the state of California literally, I think the answer is pretty straightforward. The host mother was the mother, because the mother is defined as the woman from whose body a baby is born. And the father is the, mar is, is the husband of the host mother, assuming she was married because a legal rule that goes back to the 18th century says that a married man may not contest the paternity of his wife's children as long as they were cohabiting when the child was conceived. Fortunately, the court made, I think, the right decision. They interpreted parenthood by intention and said the original couple were the legal parents. But that's a nice example of the fact that you have not only laws but thoughts. We want to know who our parents are. We want to be able to talk about other people in those terms. And as you change the technology, some of those approximations break down. Let me give you a different example, and one which could turn out to be very important. Uh, I assume some of you are familiar with the idea of cryonic suspension, the idea that you have somebody who is dying of an incurable disease, and he's a technological optimist, so he arranges imme immediately after he is legally dead, but before he is any of the relevant information encoded in his body has vanished to be frozen, held at the temperature of liquid nitrogen. And the hope is that at some point in the future, A, they will find a cure to the disease that was killing him. That's pretty likely. B, they'll find a cure to the damage done by freezing. That's possible, though by no means as likely. That's a hard, but probably not, not necessarily an insoluble problem. All right, what's the legal status of that frozen person? Let us imagine, for example, that I am that person and that a while after I am declared dead, I've got to be declared dead, otherwise freezing me is murder. So I'm declared dead, my heirs inherit my property, and my widow remarries. Ten years later, it just happens technological change has gone faster than we expected. Ten years later, there is a news story. They have successfully revived a dog. They've thawed a dog and he barked. And it's clear what's going to happen over the next ten years. A week later, my heir and my wife's, my ex-wife's, my widow's second husband break into the storage facility containing my body, smash the container with the liquid nitrogen, and let me thaw. And when they are asked to explain their actions, they say, yes, we realized that it was not legal to do that, but we couldn't stand to have somebody dear to us preserved in such a parody of life. What crime have they committed? Vandalism. What crime have they not committed? Murder, I was already dead. All right. So what this suggests is that for this purpose and many others, if, if we believe that cryonic suspension might work, we need a legal and a conceptual status in between dead and alive. All right. Uh, so that's a nice example, I think, of the problems that come from the technology changing the facts of the world that in a way that changes the ways in which we make sense of those facts, which is really the point. All right. Let me go on to sort of a very brief survey of some of the topics I cover in the book. And I want to start with the privacy one, because that's an interesting case where you've got technology pushing in both directions. Uh, I don't know how many of you are familiar with public key encryption, and I assume some of you are, and I don't really have the time to explain it. But the bottom line is that we now have technologies so that we can set things up so that strangers can send you messages that only you can read, so that you can send strangers messages that are provably from you. That's what a digital signature does. Uh, and I can create an online identity, send messages that are provably from that online identity without letting anybody know who the real space person is who controls that online identity. What that means is that we have a technology in which it is possible to combine anonymity and reputation. I can have an online identity with a reputation and yet maintain my actual anonymity. You can't hang the online identity. In many ways, that's a very attractive future. It means that we have freedom of speech that doesn't depend on the opinion of the Supreme Court, but only on the laws of mathematics. However, 
it has some unattractive features because it makes possible criminal firms with brand name reputations. If you look in the book, you will find my business plan for Murder Incorporated, which describes how you could set up a firm in the business of selling assassinations in such a way that ordinary people not part of the criminal world could locate that firm, interact with it safely, and get somebody knocked off who they wanted knocked off. As far as I can tell from news reports, the cost of a hitman is less than the cost of a new car. Most of us can afford a new car if we really want one. All right. And the reason that most of us can't arrange an assassination at the moment is that we don't know a safe way of finding someone selling the service. Many of us have moral reservations as well, but that's not the particular point I'm raising at the moment. <laughs> so in many ways, encryption gives you a very attractive world because it gives you a world where within the online world, you can't use force against people. All right? We violate people's rights by force and fraud. Online, you can only use fraud, which is a weaker method. The other guy's got to fall for it. We can't get a bullet through a T1 line. All right? So in many ways, it's very attractive, but it's got its risks. So that's one set of technologies, the one that really first got me interested in this future technology stuff, as it happens. Another set of technologies is surveillance. You put video cameras on, light po on tall poles in public places and record what's coming off, or else you've got a cop watching the screen as it happens. And that's become increasingly common. England is the country that's done most of it. There are arguments about whether it does or doesn't cut crime, but clearly it potentially can cut crime. Uh, what's wrong with it? So far, there's not much wrong. So far, you say, well, look, it's just the same thing as having a cop standing in the public place looking around. It's just that he gets to do it comfortably and out of the rain. But we now add two other technologies. One of them is face recognition software, and the other is database software. And face recognition software means that all of those films aren't feeding to people. They're feeding to computers. And the computers are identifying all the people with the result that the information about where, where and when anybody was anytime he was in a public place is now public information. And if, as I think David Brin suggests, a little more technological Improvement gives us video cameras with the size and aerodynamic characteristics of a mosquito. Public place is no longer limited to where you can surveil people. So I like to imagine the judge, he's a somewhat old-fashioned judge 20 years from now, and he starts out by saying to the, to the defender, or maybe it's the prosecutor who says to the defendant, where were you at, at 11 AM on Friday the 17th? Oh, wait a minute, I'm sorry, I don't have to ask that question anymore. Types into the computer, and there is the film showing where that defendant was at that time. So that gives you, a, basically, encryption gives you a world with more privacy than we've ever known, and surveillance gives you a world with less privacy than we've ever known. Surveillance plus face recognition plus databases. Uh, what happens if you have both? And that hinges on two different questions. The first is, can you protect from surveillance your interface to the net? All right? If I'm ty typing my encrypted messages and there's a video mosquito sitting here watching my fingers, the encryption is not doing me a whole lot of good. Type under a hood. Maybe we have mind to machine links so that, but you have to have some way of making sure that the surveillance can't see your online interactions. The second question is, how much does real space matter? All right. The more of your life is being lived in cyberspace where encryption can protect you, the less it matters whether people watch you uh, in real space. And that's going to get into a subject I have a chapter on, which is virtual reality. And you can imagine futures in which nothing important is happening in real space. All the real stuff is happening in virtual reality. Uh, a couple of other things related to this. Uh, one of the things we know how to do but haven't really done yet is a fully anonymous e-cash digital money. So we know how to set up systems where I make a payment to you by sending a message. I don't have to know who you are. You don't have to know who I am. And the bank doesn't have to know who either of us is. Now, that has a few minor uh, consequences. It makes money laundering laws unenforceable. But since money laundering laws are mostly used to enforce laws I don't think should exist, that doesn't bother me, though it might bother various other people. Uh, but again, it gives you a much more private world. Uh, and I've actually got a couple of published articles on the related question of how do you enforce contracts 
in a world where you may not know the real world identity of the person you're dealing with. And the basic argument again is two mechanisms for enforcing contracts. One is the courts, one is reputation. The same technology that makes it harder to use the courts makes it easier to use reputation. So I've got a couple of published articles on how you enforce contracts in cyberspace in a world where you need reputational mechanisms rather than court-based mechanisms to do it. All right, let me run through a few of my other technologies because this is really a two-hour lecture and I've got to squeeze. Uh, one of them is biotech. And I like to say that there is a stealth biotech. There is a new technology with potentially revolutionary effects fully developed that nobody has noticed. It's paternity testing. All right? One of the central facts of all human societies is it is a wise child that knows his father. And if you think about how reproduction is organized in almost all human societies, a central part of it is setting it up so that men know which children are theirs which basically means giving men exclusive, or trying to give men, most of the time succeeding in giving men, exclusive sexual access to the woman during the period she conceives. We no longer have to do that. All right? Whether it'll change societies, I don't know, but we now have the technology in which you could have people uh, engaged in all sorts of polyamory, promis promiscuity, any different complicated mating patterns, and still have people know who their children were. Will it change anything? I don't know. The ultimate question there, I think, is whether male sexual jealousy is hardwired, in which case we're going to keep doing things roughly the way we've done it, or whether what's hardwired is the desire to know who your children are, in which case over time human institutions will adapt. But that's sort of a case where we have the technology but we haven't really noticed yet. There are obviously a bunch of others. In particular, there's the technology that I like to think of as libertarian eugenics which is technologies that allow parents to choose among the children they could have which ones they will have. And this idea I first saw in a very old science fiction novel by Robert Heinlein, Beyond This Horizon, which is one of his weakest novels but is full of neat ideas. And the neat idea here is essentially a technology that lets the parents choose which egg and which sperm in order to combine desirable genetic characteristics of both parents and that could affect the world quite substantially, although not very fast. Because one of the relevant constraints in all of this is that because human beings have such a long reproductive cycle, because we're long-lived organisms, none of that kind of stuff can change things in less than 20 years, and it'll probably take 40 or 50, whereas some of the other things could hit much faster. Uh, the other biotech, there are obviously some dangerous biotech stuff, you know, tailored plagues and stuff. I'm not going to talk about that right now. Everybody knows that those are possibilities out there. The other biotech that interests me, though, of course, is life extension. Uh, I really don't think that three score and 10 is long enough, not even 110. I don't see any good theoretical reason why that problem can't be solved. And given the rate of biological progress in the past century, I think it's quite likely it will be solved. <coughs> and that then raises a bunch of interesting questions at the individual level. If you're going to live for hundreds or thousands of years, what life do you live? Do you say, all right, live the life as I lived it, age 65, retire, spend the next 300 years retired? <laughs> do you say, I've got this nice profession, I'm good at it, I'll just keep doing it. After all, I'm not old and feeble this, in this. Or perhaps one of the interesting ones, do you say, well, it was really fun. It was really fun being an economist you know, up to age 60. I think it would be fun to be a novelist for the next 60 years. Or do something else. And there are examples. Elizabeth Moon is a pretty successful science fiction writer who used to be a marine officer. Uh, and there are other, other cases, cases like that. Uh, or do you say, I'm going to get the best of both worlds. What I'm going to do is to save up enough money so I can live at a tolerable standard with no future income. And then I'll take jobs when I want to. When somebody offers me something that's fun to do and makes me money, I'll do it. And if not, I won't. And that strikes me as a rather attractive, attractive future. Uh, let me go on to another one of the dangerous ones uh, and exciting ones, and that's artificial intelligence. That Raymond Kurzweil's estimate is about 30 years to human level artificial intelligence. Which sounds really great until you say, but wait a minute. If the speed of computers continues to increase as it has in the past, that means that in 40 years, we're gerbils. In 40 years, we are sharing the planet with beings enormously smarter than we are, and we'd better hope they like pets. 
Uh, Kurzweil's solution is that we become machines too. His solution is that when we know enough to do AI, we know enough to do good mind to machine links. Now you do some of your thinking in carbon and some of it in silicon. The silicon's getting faster and faster and faster. And after a while, your body is up and you carry away along with you out of sentimental memory. But for most practical purposes, you're a machine too. And that's a really interesting, weird future. It might even happen. Uh, virtual reality, I'm running out of time, so I'll do this uh, very quickly. Uh, if you have good enough virtual reality, if what I like to refer to as cracking the dreaming problem, because after all, we have full sense virtual reality when we're asleep. If you can figure out ways of giving a completely viable illusion uh, to you, in that case, you can imagine a world where in real space, everybody is, living, is, is lying in a little cot in sort of a, you know, like an oversized airport uh, storage locker and your body is exercising against resistant stuff, but you're not aware of that because from your standpoint you're doing something else and you're being fed really nutritious glop. But to you, that glop is filet mignon and sushi and Baskin Robbins ice cream because all of that is just information stuff, sense stuff, the computer can send it to you. And to you, you are living in your own estate on the California coast and there's no problem of land use because someone else can be living in the same estate on this California coast because his estate is in his virtual world and yours is in your virtual world. And then the intriguing question is, in what sense is that a fake? In what sense is that world poor and in what sense rich? And this is a puzzle which Robert Nozick, a fairly philosoph important philosopher, put a long time ago in the form of what he called an experience machine. His, he was imagining that you can plug into this machine and have the illusion of the rest of your life and the illusory life somehow is guaranteed to be a little bit better than the real life would have been. And the question is, do you plug in? And it's complicated because some of the things that I care about doing are information transactions. I don't care if you read my book in hard copy or on the screen. In either case, you're getting my ideas. But I care a great deal whether the children that I love are real human beings or merely NPCs being generated by a high-end computer that can make very believable? I know, I mean, some NPCs are hard to believe, it's true. But uh, anyway, uh, so it seems to me that for information transactions that uh, virtual reality is just as good as the ordinary reality, but there are some things where we care whether they happen in real space. So that my reaction to, to Bob Nozick's experience machine was I wouldn't touch that thing with a 10-foot pole. Uh, but it nonetheless is, I think, an interesting question, and it's a real question if you think about those of us who get involved in World of Warcraft. Should we feel bothered about the fact that we're spending all this time and energy creating, in a sense, imaginary goods in an imaginary world when the same time and energy could be spent doing real things in the real world? And I think sometimes we should be worried about it, and sometimes times we shouldn't. Uh, the I should say one point I make in the book is that when I started writing the book, I didn't know which of these technologies was going to hit first. And as I say in the final published version, now we have a winner. And the winner is World of Warcraft. That is to say, we now have one of these future technologies, namely VR, which is affecting tens of millions of people. Probably only about 10 million for WoW, but there are other competing things which add up to maybe 100 million people. Hundreds of thousands of people making their living getting virtual goods and then selling them for real money in poor countries where wages are low. So in that sense, virtual reality is becoming an increasingly important part of our lives uh, and I suspect is going to be at least as important as television was and, and maybe, maybe more so. Let me give a sort of a summary because I'm really running out of time because I want some time for questions. Uh, and one of the bottom lines of the book and of my views is that the future is radically uncertain. That people devote a lot of attention to worrying about global warming. And it's silly. It's silly not in the sense that it isn't real, but that of future risk, it's one of the little baby ones. That global warming on current extrapolations in about 100 years is going to raise sea level by a foot or two and raise global temperatures by two or three degrees centigrade. I've got three different technologies that can wipe out our species faster than that. 
All right, nanotech can do it. I haven't discussed the gray goo problem. Biotech can do it, and AI can sure do it. All right, so that furthermore, all of the analysis of global warming, most of it, assumes that the world will more or less be the same for the next 100 years. We'll be using coal and oil and all the stuff we're using. That's the least likely of all predictions. All right, I don't know how it's going to change, but if all our traveling is being done in virtual reality, no gas gets used for that. <laughs> all right. Uh, furthermore, if our lives are most in virtual reality, we can live in a climate where you don't have to spend a lot of money for heating and air conditioning if those things are expensive. So that in general, I think one can't extrapolate more than a few decades into the future. We're going to have a very interesting century, and it may be wonderful, and it may be terrible, and it may be both, and we don't, in fact, know uh, and can't know. Now, there's lots more stuff in the book. In particular, the puzzle for my fellow libertarians of whether technological progress can make the world worse. And I argue it can under some circumstances. But I think I've just about run out of the time that I set myself, because I like answering questions. Because when you're answering a question, you know at least one person in the audience is interested in what you're saying. <laughs> uh, so I'm going to stop here, uh, recommend that you all read the books you have. And you can tell your friends that if they want to read the book, they can read it online for free. Thank you. Nobody? No questions at all. I'll explain the economic argument for why, the, why progress can make us worse off. But surely somebody has questions. Yes? I'm not making, no, I'm not, I am not saying that. The question is, am I saying society will adapt to whatever happens? Well, there's a sense in which society will adapt to whatever happens, but the adaptation might consist of our all being dead. right? I'm not arguing that we will necessarily do the right things. I am rather asking, uh, what effects will these have, and what might be sensible ways of dealing with them? You know, it's possible that as copyright dies, the RIAA will own enough senators so that they will make more and more and more stringent laws. But I think at some point, it'll become clear that that isn't working, that King Canute was right. He doesn't get to stop the tide coming in. I should say the story about King Canute, people always tell it as if Canute was the guy who thought he could stop the tide. He wasn't. He was demonstrating to one of his courtiers who claimed he was so powerful he could stop the tide that he couldn't. Uh, but anyway. All right, the, 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 the claim that technological progress is going to make us worse off is an old claim, and so far I think it's always been wrong. That so far things have in fact gotten better and better for most of the inhabitants of the world for the last few hundred years. The question is, can it? And as an economist, I want to start out with the central problem that all human societies face, which is the coordination problem. You've got, let us say, 300 million or 6 billion people. And for anyone to do anything requires the cooperation of a whole lot of other people. All right. uh, how do you arrange it so that if I want to build a car, someone is making the iron and the rubber and the glass, and someone, if someone wants to make iron, somebody is making the coal that you need to turn the iron ore into iron, and if someone wants to make glass, someone is making glass furnaces and all the rest of it. And there are basically only two solutions, or at least two groups of solutions to this problem. The obvious solution is central control. The obvious solution is somebody at the top says, you mine that amount of coal, <coughs> you mine that much iron ore, you do this, you do that, and so forth. That system works for very small societies. That's how a family or a small firm gets run. It doesn't scale. It breaks down very badly for reasons that economists have been pointing out for most of a century and that the rest of the world finally has begun to face after the collapse of the Soviet Union when you try to scale it up to a large scale. The systems that do work are decentralized systems along the general lines of property and trade. And there are different varieties. But essentially, each person controls some small subset of the world. And if I want you to do something, I make you an offer you're willing to accept. And a semester of price theory is about what it takes to show why, at least in simplified models, that gives you the right answer. That gives you successful coordination. But 
those simplified models depend on a world in which, roughly speaking, what I do with my stuff only affects me and the people who've agreed to be affected. All right? We can do a little better than that. We've got tort law, which tries to deal with some cases where what I do with my stuff also affects the people who haven't agreed. But tort law is a very clumsy mechanism. And the conclusion, in my view, is that the longer the range of the effects of human action, the harder it is to split up the world into pieces such that my stuff is affected by what I do and your stuff is affected by what you do, the harder it is to make the decentralized mechanism for coordination work. Because you will increasingly you can have cases where I make the correct decision of what's in my interest, the correct decision of what's in the interest of the people I'm dealing with, whose permission I need to do things, but I'm imposing large costs or failing to provide large benefits to 10 million other people. That's the logic of global warming. What's interesting about global warming is not that it's really a catastrophic threat. As far as I can tell, it isn't. What's interesting is that it could be that the internal logic of the global warming argument is right, even if the scale of the effect looks as though it's small enough so that it might be unfortunate, but it's not catastrophic. Because the internal logic is that I do not include in my decision of whether or not to burn something the effect on the temperature of India. And there isn't any practical mechanism that can make me include that, in my opinion. That global government is a cure that's worse than the disease and probably wouldn't do it anyway, if you look at how badly national governments even deal with those problems within a single nation. So the risk of technological progress is that because it makes us more powerful, because it lets us do more things, it might create a situation in which routinely most of the costs and benefits of my action are borne by distant people. And in that world, we're down from one solution to the coordination problem to zero solutions to the coordination problem. And that would be a very unfortunate outcome. I'm not predicting that will happen. Technological change goes the other way as well. That if, after all, nanotech is good enough, I don't really care what you're putting into the air of your property because my little nanites are, are watching the boundary of my property scrubbing the air as it comes across. If surveillance is good enough, some of those externalities we can deal with better through the legal system because we know exactly what happened. That one of, my, uh, one of my thoughts combining various of my interests is that our legal system is redundant. We have two legal systems called criminal law and tort law, which do the same thing in different ways. I do something bad to you. You either call a cop or call a lawyer. The legal system intervenes. Something bad happens to me, so I don't do bad things to people. It's not clear why we have both of them. And if you're interested, I devote a chapter of a different book, my book, Law's Order, to that puzzle. But one argument that can be made is that we need criminal law for offenses that are hard to detect. Because under tort law, if it costs me a lot of money and effort to get a 10% chance of catching you, I'm not going to be able to get enough money and damages to make it worth doing. So that's an argument. If we have a world of really good surveillance, which is quite an unattractive world in other ways, one result may be that we always know who committed the crime. That all criminal law starts looking like tort law, and the argument is not did you do it, but what are the legal consequences, which is what a tort case is about. Is what you did illegal? How much damage you did, and so forth. So you might end up converting criminal law to, to something more like tort law. I prefer decentralized private systems to centralized government systems, so that strikes me as a good thing. Some of you may know I've done work on a legal system a 1,000 years ago, where if you killed somebody, his relatives sued you. Uh, but in any case, similarly, we might get better ways for monitoring auto emissions. You can think of lots of ways in which the technology might reduce these problems. All I'm saying is that we don't have any guarantee that technological progress will be good. So far, it has been. It's quite possible that it will be. It might not be. All right, that was my final bit. Question. Yes, question, wonderful. Yeah. So uh, there's one, one thing in your talk uh, uh, really uh, surprised and puzzled me, which is when you're talking about uh, the Nozick experience machine. Yes. And you made the statement that you care whether the children you care about are real. Yes. I wanted to, to focus on a, what, what you meant by real in that. Sure. Because as, as you stated it, it sounds like if they were a genuine upload with no physical or biological well, that's embodiment. That's all right. Okay. That's what I mean by real. I mean that they aren't an illusion drawn for me by the computer. Okay. 
So, so if, if, the process, if the computational process of bringing about their appearance has as much of a depth of cognition behind it as, uh, as, as you're expecting, then that qualifies as real. It's, it, it's, it, it, it might. It would have to be not just as much of. It's got to, I mean, there are a variety of reasons why I like my okay. children, and you can okay. imagine an AI that was just as smart as my children, harder though that may be to imagine, uh, and which nonetheless I didn't like and wasn't glad to have brought into existence. But no, my point was not about a difference between software running on carbon and software running on silicon. Okay. It was a difference between, the, the fundamental question I'm really getting at is, is all that matters to me my perceptions? And that does, if you could tell me in advance that you're going to forget about this conversation in 30 seconds, and we're going to give you the illusion of a great life, none of which will be real. It's just signals beamed into your head making you think it's happening. My conclusion is I would not choose that life. And that really is quite a general issue, because in a way that's the issue of drug use, of recreational drugs. That is there some sense in which it is less legitimate to feel happy because you've adjusted your neurochemistry than it is to feel happy because you've written a great book which people like. And I think it is less legitimate. I'm not saying I can prove it, but that's my intuition about that subject. And I'm not objecting to people who want to take recreational drugs, but I think there really is a difference between wanting to do that and wanting to achieve things. I should say, I have a chapter I haven't discussed on mind drugs. And mind drugs is another very interesting subject, because given the progress we've made in medicine and understanding the mind, it's likely we'll be able to do quite a lot of things, some of them attractive and some of them unattractive. The attractive ones are basically ways of enhancing your cognitive function in different ways. The unattractive ones are ways of controlling other people. So that you could imagine a credulity drug. I like to sort of imagine for a science fiction future that a world where no contract is valid unless you've had a blood test just before you signed it to make sure you weren't drugged into signing it. And of course, the nanotech version of that is I've got this little LED on my wrist, which tells me whether there's anything in my blood I ought to be worried about. Uh, so, so I think mind drugs are an interesting, an interesting subject. Uh, happiness I sort of have mixed feelings about because I observe that some people seem to be naturally happy. There are people who, as far as, and, and my guess is that is neurochemistry, I'm not sure. So is there anything wrong? Suppose we can say, look, we're not going to make you believe you wrote a great book when you didn't. We'll just make you, at any given situation, happier than you were before. Anything wrong with that? Well, probably not. But. Uh, sort of seems, feels a little fake, but being happy is nicer than being sad. So if you really know what you're doing, that might be, might be an improvement. But anyway, that's one of the mind drugs or one of the things that I, that I discuss. And in some ways, these are old issues. If you think about alcohol, alcohol is an enhancer. Some people function better when they've had a drink. It is a recreational drug. It is a control drug. You get people drunk. Uh, the, traditionally, men get women drunk to seduce them. All right, so it's in a sense all of these different categories, and it's just that we're going to get a whole lot better at doing this in the next 20 or 30 years, and we want to think a little bit about the implications of that. I should say, at one point I make at the beginning of the book, and might as well make at the end of the lecture, I don't know which revolutions are going to happen. They can't all happen. All right, if AI takes over, we're not going to have the time to use, use libertarian eugenics to make us all into supermen. They'll, they'll beat us to it. If nanotech wipes out all living organisms in the year 2030, none of the interesting thoughts for the year 2040 are going to happen. And it may be that the revolution that happens will be one I haven't thought about. But my view is that having thought about 10 or 15 revolutions and tried to think through their implications, even if it's the 16th one we haven't thought of that drops out of the sky, we'll be a little better prepared uh, to deal with. More questions? You've got three minutes. Wouldn't want to um, waste it. Uh, my question was, uh, it's actually related to the question that uh, Mark asked. It is uh, sourced from a conversation we've had earlier on, ha on happiness and what makes people happy. Um, and, and this is one thing that, that uh, alcohol and drugs perhaps get wrong and Warcraft, World of Warcraft gets right. And, and the difference is that in World of Warcraft, even though it's an illusion, it's still an illusion where you are interacting with other people. You still continue to desire more. I mean, even though you are still eating goop, my goop is 
is more impressive than yours as a result of me having spent longer time playing this game. And as a result, I still have a desire to go out and produce, even though the thing that I'm producing is perhaps in some sense less real. Now, uh, with, with the improvements in technology that you've talked about, however, uh, it'll get, if, if the virtual reality that I am in is disconnected from the virtual reality that you are in, then once I've achieved a basic level of sustenance, I cease to have the desire to continue to improve myself because it's just me. There's no other interaction with anybody else. I can you know, jack up all of the dials, achieve the bliss that I am after, and, and as a result, not need to continue to produce anymore. Uh, do you think that, the, that this distinction between technology is one which will result in a world which continues to be productive versus one which yeah. results in a, a lot of science fiction horrors? You're, in a sense, taking Nozick's experience machine versus World of Warcraft. Right. In his experience machine, there was no interaction. Right. Uh, but notice you still need the gloop that physically feeds you. So presumably, there's going to have to be enough production to keep the real space part of the system working. Right? You might make a mistake, but assuming you haven't made a mistake, when you set up the system, you set it up in such a way that you're spending an hour every year on doing real world production of some sort, or maybe indirectly running machines, but doing things in the real world. But I guess I'm really more interested in what's in a sense the philosophical question of what matters, and my feeling that somehow World of Warcraft in a certain sense is better than an ordinary video game because you're interacting with human beings, not entirely with illusions. But in some respect, it's less good than a real space thing, because part of what you're doing is illusions. There's a book you might want to look at, if you haven't, called Synthetic Worlds by Castronovo, which is not entirely satisfactory. But he makes some interesting points. And one point is that the designer of something like World of Warcraft can structure it, taking advantage of what we know about human beings, to be the world that you will sort of enjoy being in. Part of that is for good reasons, but part of that is, in a sense, playing off irrational elements in human, in, in human nature that you can predict. So, I mean, and one of the big questions, really, which he's implied raising, which you ought to think about, is can real space compete with virtual reality, given that virtual reality can be designed to be fun in, and real space has not been designed to be fun in? We've got to <laughs> make it that ourselves. Yes? Yes. Uh, one free market idea that's really uh, taken over is the idea of uh, tradable pollution credits as opposed yeah. to regulation, strict regulation for enforcing uh, uh, pollution. Uh, what, what, are, what are we doing well in the implementation of that, and what, what could we uh, do better? Yeah. And are there other areas where that, uh, where that yeah. sort of idea could be applied? Yeah. That is, from the economic standpoint, there are really two variants of the same idea. One of them is what's called a Pigouvian tax, which is that you pay a certain amount per unit of pollution, and the other is you have some total amount of pollution, some way of deciding who's entitled to produce how much of it, and they trade it. And in a sense, they're very close to the same because you're paying a price to buy or giving up the opportunity to sell in either case. Mm -hmm. And there are two differences between those two. One of them is that for the emission fee version, you need an estimate of what the marginal damage is done by your emissions. Mm -hmm. For the tradable permit system, you need an estimate of what the optimal amount of emissions is. Mm -hmm. And under some circumstances, you might have better information on one, and some circumstances, better information on the other. The other, which is politically important, is that if a tradable permit system is done giving the existing polluters the right to a certain amount of pollution, which they then trade among themselves, then the concentrated interest most likely to oppose the scheme is being bought off because they're getting this valuable asset. You can even set up situations where they're richer as a result of the system, not poorer, and that makes it more likely to pass. My reservation about such schemes in the global warming sense is that I think, A, we don't know what the marginal cost or the optimal level is, and B, we are likely to end up with the political system producing wildly incorrect estimates. And you can see that just in terms of public discussion, that we don't really even know what the sign of the effect is. It's not really clear that global warming is bad. Everybody talks as if it's bad. It will surely have bad consequences and good consequences, too. You know, Canada is going to get twice as wide, if you think about it, in effect. Uh, crops grow better with more CO2. CO2 is an input to photosynthesis. And yet, given the sort of nature of how these things are determined, it's likely that people will pick either some fixed limit, which they keep doing with no idea whether it's worth getting or not, or some high price. 
So my, I'm, in fact, my preferred policy is to more or less ignore the issue. I've discussed this on my blog and argued with various people about it, not because there isn't a potential problem, but because I don't see any control mechanism that isn't likely to do more damage than good. And we have, we have time for um, one more question. One more question? I don't want to hold you up. My wife had to leave early, but she left me a note saying, ask what happens if Supreme Court judges live forever. What happens if tenured university professors live forever uh, in a world where it's no longer legal to have forced retirement, which is the world we're now in? Uh, yeah, no, that's an interesting question. It's the general question of whether life extension leads to cultural stasis. And Supreme Court ju justices, my guess is you would change the Constitution to give them a term. But if you think about other contexts where you've got somebody who has filled a niche very successfully, say politicians. All right, incumbents never lose. All right, that's a first approximation, but it's roughly true. I think about 97% of incumbents, congressmen who run win. And you can see why. They've got a reputation. They've been able to do favors for people uh, and so forth. So that you do have to worry. Uh, there's a book, there's a science fiction novel whose name I now forget, which deals with a world where basically it's run by a gerontocracy uh, as a result of this. Uh, but, you know, that, that, that's a legitimate problem uh, with, with life extension, but not enough of a problem to make me want to die, <laughs> all right? Uh, and it may well be that, you know, people have argued that scientific progress doesn't really come from people changing their minds. It really comes from old scientists dying. Uh, so you might have a world in which there was this one layer of scientists who still believed in Ptolemaic astronomy, and another layer who still believed in Newtonian physics, and another layer who believed in relativistic physics, and so forth. Uh, that would be a sort of entertaining world. Uh, all right, fine. Thank you all. <laughs>